We've been looking forward to this night for a long time. Dr. Paul Tripp is the president of Paul Tripp Ministries. He's been a pastor, an event speaker, a best-selling and award-winning author. He's authored more than 30 books and video series on the Christian living. His driving passion is to connect the transforming power of Jesus Christ to everyday life. I've read Dangerous Calling a couple of times. I have a number of others on my shelf, such as Sex and Money, Awe, and uh, New Morning Mercies. But his Advent volume this past uh, Christmas time, Come Let Us Adore Him, was my personal Christmas Advent season series of devotions. And it uh, was a book that marked my life, as has Dangerous Calling at Deep Ways. I think for those of us who have been in ministry for a lifetime, uh, I'm uh, pushing over 45 years in uh, the ministry. Uh, the older I get in the ministry, the more meaningful what Paul Tripp has written has become. He has the unusual ability to speak to us who uh, are in ministry about uh, ministry, but about us, and especially taking us back to uh, the core, which is our relationship with Jesus Christ. He and his wife, Luella, live in Philadelphia. They have four grown children. Paul, thank you for taking time out of a very busy travel schedule, speaking schedule, and writing schedule to spend uh, tonight and tomorrow with us at DTS. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Paul David Tripp? Well, it's great to be, be with you. Uh, we flew out today from Philadelphia, the home of the Super Bowl champions. Sorry, I'm just not mature enough to resist. <laughs> well, on October 19th of 2014, my life changed. I didn't want my life to change. I didn't hope my life would change. I didn't plan for my life to change, but my life changed. I was experiencing some, some minor physical symptoms. I called my doctor. He said, you live right in Center City, Philadelphia, near... Jefferson Hospital, just go there and they'll check you out. Well, Sunday after morning worship service, we walked over to Jefferson Hospital. We stopped at Starbucks on the way for worship. <laughs> uh, and sat in the emergency room watching the Eagles play in 2014. The best place to watch the Eagles play was in an emergency room. It was pretty painful. <clears throat> and I thought I would be examined and sent home. Well, they called me back into the examining room, and within 20 minutes, there were residents from five different departments of the hospital in my, my examining room. Uh, things got very serious very fast. I, that wasn't a brief examination, 10 days later, I was still in the hospital. The first 36 hours, my body went into full body spasms. It was the most horrible experience, painful experience of my life. I literally screamed for 36 hours. What I didn't know is I was in acute renal failure. My kidneys were dying, and I didn't know it. That was followed by two years of six surgeries in two years, a surgery every four months. If you have a surgery every four months, you don't recover before you have the next surgery. Lost 65% of my kidney function. Confronted with the reality that in my moment of greatest ministry influence, I was rendered weak weaker than I've ever been in my life. That the old Paul would never be again. Now hear what I'm about to say. When that happens to you, you will always preach some kind of gospel to yourself. Everyone in this room is a theologian. Everyone in this room is a philosopher. Everyone in this room is an archaeologist and you will dig through the mound of your existence in order to make sense out of your life. I say this to people all the time, and they smile when I say it, but I'm really quite serious. No one's more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. <laughs> See, you laughed. 
Uh, most of us learned it's best not to move our lips when you're talking to yourself. <laughs> and if you're talking to yourself, don't change positions. <laughs> They'll put you away. But you're in a constant conversation with yourself and the things that you say to you, about you, about God, are profoundly important. And I wonder for you and for me how great a gap there is between the theology that we formally say we believe, the gospel that we've signed on to in our confessions, and the gospel that we preach to ourselves when we face those unwanted, unexpected moments in our lives. God has ordained for us between the already of our con conversion and the not yet of our home going to live in a world that's dramatically broken. If you're not suffering now, you're near someone who is. And if you're not suffering now, you will someday. So what kind of gospel do you preach to you? I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 27 or your iPad or iPhone or whatever weird, sad, off-brand you're carrying. <laughs> and I want to read just the, the first five verses of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat of my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high on a rock. Scholars who study these things say that this psalm was written in one of two very dark moments of trouble in David's life. Some say it was written when David was fleeing from the jealous anger of Saul. You remember the story. David had been nothing but a loyal servant to Saul, but the anointing of God was on David, and David was doing amazing things, and Saul was eaten with jealousy and was out to do David harm. It was a situation of gross personal injustice. Imagine being in that situation where literally you have to flee for your life. Or some say that Psalm 27 was written when David was fleeing from his own son, Absalom, who had conspired to take his throne. Imagine the sense of heartbreaking betrayal. It is in either this situation of gross personal injustice or this situation of dark family betrayal that the words of this psalm are written. And notice how this psalm begins. A psalm that is written in trouble doesn't begin with trouble. It begins with theology. And brothers and sisters, a lesson just in that for us. There is never a moment in your life where the crisp, clear Wisdom of the theology of the word of God is more important than you, when you are facing what is hard and unplanned and unexpected and unthinkable. Run, 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 not to your emotions. Run, 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 not to your experiences. Run, run, run to the theology of the word of God. That theology is your guide. That theology is your protector. I love the theology of the Word of God. The Lord is light. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is stronghold. Beautiful metaphors. What is, 
What is light? Light is a metaphor for what is pure and holy and righteous and just sitting on the throne of this universe that now is confusing me is one who is the definition of what is true, the definition of what is holy, the definition of what is righteous. The Lord is salvation. In the broadest sense, what does that mean? Deliverance from evil, deliverance from evil internal, and ultimately for evil external. There'll be a day when we all get to attend a funeral that we'll actually want to go to. We'll get to attend the funeral of sin and death because sin and death will die. That gets me up in the morning. The Lord is stronghold. The, the word picture there is that fortified city thick enough to ride a chariot around it, a place of refuge, a place to run under attack. The Lord is light. The Lord is salvation. The Lord is stronghold. Now, I'm about to confuse you. You need to pay attention. Oh, you young theologues. <laughs> pay attention. What I've just given you is bad on biblical theology. It's bad will hurt you theology. Do you know why? Does anybody know? I left out a word. I left it out three times. Do you know the word? Say it. Say it like you mean it. Enough of abstract, impersonal, distant theology. It's not the theology of the word of God. David is not saying somewhere out there there's light. Somewhere out there there's salvation. Somewhere out there there's stronghold. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. Speaking better than David would able to know, he's saying, glorious grace somehow, some way has attached me to this one who is light. Glorious grace has attached me to this one who is salvation. Glorious grace has attached me to this one who is stronghold. There better be a big my in the middle of your theology. You can feel my passion. Listen, the theology of the Word of God is not meant to just define for you who God is, but to redefine who you are as His children. Amen. You get your identity from the theology of the Word of God, not from your track record. Praise God for that. Listen, theology is never an end in itself. Theology is a means to an end. And the end is a radically transformed, God-surrendered, God-hoping life. I get my courage from my theology. I get my hope from my theology. I get my identity from my theology. I get my security from my theology. I get my rest from my theology. It's life. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. How could it be? That he would be light for me. How could it be that he would be salvation for me? How could it be that he would be stronghold for me? How could it be that this blessing would be showered down on me? This is not dispassionate, abstract, informational theology. This man is speaking to his own soul. Listen, the beginning of this psalm, you're able to eavesdrop on a private conversation. This man is preaching the gospel to himself in a cave, running from his son. Where does he run? He doesn't just run from Absalom. He runs to his theology. When you read the first part of Psalm 27, read it with passion. Read it with joy. Now, look what happens next. This is the backdrop. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, though an army and camp against me, though war rise, rises against me. I love the shocking 
honesty of the Word of God. In fact, I think the Psalms are incredibly honest. I think the Psalms are in in the Bible to keep us honest about the messiness and confusing nature of faith. The Bible is both shockingly honest and gloriously hopeful at the same time. And the honesty doesn't diminish the hope and the hope doesn't negate the honesty. There are stories in Scripture that are so weird and tawdry that if they were in a paperback book at your local bookstore, you wouldn't pick them up. Why are they in your Bible? So that you would know that God's almighty arms of grace wrap themselves around the deepest and darkest of human experiences. There's no experience in life that's beyond the reach of God's grace. That's why those stories are in the Bible. Now hear this. Biblical faith will never ask you to deny reality. If you're denying reality, you may have temporary peace, but you're not exercising biblical faith. When you have a bad week and somebody at your church who actually loves you comes up to you and says, how was your week? Don't say, the problems were many, but the Lord was faithful. (laughs) Who talks that way? You say, get a grip. (laughs) Be honest. When you pray, be honest. Jesus doesn't need you to lie to defend his reputation. This is honest stuff here. I love love the story of Abraham and Sarah, the summary in in Romans 4, where it says that uh, as Abraham was waiting for God to fulfill the promise, he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. That's pretty specific, isn't it? That's not denying reality. This was an old woman. She was way beyond any hope that she would bear a child. But you got to hear the rest of it. It says, as he was waiting, he grew strong in faith, being persuaded that the one who made the promise was faithful. Now, there's a point here that you need to observe. That's telling you something about Abraham's meditation. No, Abraham didn't deny reality, but he didn't meditate on that impossible reality. He meditated on the power and glory and goodness of God. And because he meditated on the power and glory and goodness of God, he actually, why he was waiting, grew strong in faith. Biblical faith will not ask ask you to deny reality. But if you meditate on the broken realities of the fallen world, you're going down. What happens to most of us as we wait? It's a chronicle of weakening faith, growing hopelessness. Because we're not meditating on our Redeemer, we're meditating on our difficulty. And know this God is in the wait, God has ordained the wait. Because waiting under God's administration is not just about what you will get at the end of the wait, listen to me, but about what you will become as you're waiting. Waiting is redemptive activity. It's not God off having lunch. Now, if you were in this situation where when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, when people around you wanted you for lunch. Camp to get you, against you to do you harm. Let me ask you this question, and I would like you to do something for me right now. Well, it's actually for you. Right now, 
fire your inner lawyer. I can ask you to do that because I have an inner law firm. <laughs> fire your inner lawyer and open your heart. And ask this question to yourself honestly. When you're in this kind of unthinkable moment, when you feel like you are being wronged, when people who should love and respect you want harm for you, what would be the one thing you would desire? How about weapons? <laughs> Makes sense to me. Or I think most of us pray in these moments, we pray only for deliverance, right? We pray what I call vacuum cleaner prayers. You don't even need words. You just say, dear Jesus, in your name, amen. Suck me out of here and drop me here. Dear Heavenly Father, in your name, amen. And I'll sing, great is thy faithfulness. Notice, notice what David says. Now remember, this is not theoretical. This is written out of unthinkable moments. I cannot think of what would be in my heart if I knew my son was doing to me what Absalom was doing to David. It's just unthinkable for a dad. It, this psalm is written in that kind of real moment. One thing I have asked the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. What? Seriously? Now, Either David's delusional or he's so super spiritual that we can't relate to him or he's on to something. Why would David say in the darkest of human moments in crushing interpersonal grief, what I want to do is run to the temple and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Well, David has come to understand this, that sitting on the throne of the universe is one who is stunningly more beautiful than any ugly thing you're ever going to face in your life. Sitting on the throne of the universe, connected by grace to his children, is one who is gloriously more beautiful than any ugly thing you'll face in your life. He's beautiful in wisdom. He's beautiful in love. He's beautiful in faithfulness. He's beautiful in mercy. He's beautiful in grace. He's beautiful in so sovereignty. He's beautiful in patience. He's beautiful in love. He's beautiful. 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 Now hear what I'm about to say. And you will only properly understand the ugly things that you face between the already and the not yet when you look at them through the lens of the stunning beauty of your Redeemer. You will only ever properly understand the ugly things that you will inevitably face in this broken world when you look at those things through the lens of the stunning, incalculable, glorious beauty of your Redeemer. Now I'm not done. And he showers that beauty down on us by grace. What I'm about to say, it is the glory of my life that I can say these words, I mean it. Here I'm about to say, all that God is, he is for you by grace. Think about that. We could unpack that for the rest of our lives. All that God is in his stunning beauty, in his stunning glory, 
He is for us by grace. He's faithful for you by grace. He's powerful by you by grace. By grace. He's sovereign for you by grace. He's wise for you by grace. He's merciful for you by grace. He's patient for you by grace. All that God is, He is for us by grace. David has come to understand that the ultimate fact of facts, the ultimate interpretive instrument of what is, is the existence and beauty of the Lord. The ultimate way of understanding life is through the lens of the beauty of the Lord. The ultimate way of making sense of my identity is the beauty of the Lord. The ultimate way of unpacking my circumstances is the beauty of the Lord. The ultimate way of finding hope is the beauty of the Lord. The ultimate motivation to deal with what I have to deal with is the beauty of the Lord. God is the ultimate fact of facts through which I make sense of all that is. You will only ever properly understand the hard, heartbreaking, disappointing things that you'll face when you look at him through the stunning beauty of the Redeemer. For me, that meant the realization that God doesn't need me to be strong to use me. He doesn't use, he doesn't call anyone because they're able. He calls us because he's able. That's, that's the plan. Listen, your weakness is not in the way of what God would do through you, but your delusions of strength will be. In the midst of this experience, I wrote a book. I wrote a book in, during abject suffering. Uh, a book called Parenting. Maybe some of you have seen that book. This is no exaggeration. When I got that book, the first copy of that book, I carried it upstairs to my wife, Luella, in tears. And I said, I, I, Luella, this, will, this doesn't make sense to me. It probably won't to you. I don't remember writing this book. And for the first time, in all the books I've written, I sat down and read my own book from cover to cover. That's what God's able to do. And people have said to me that that book talks about parenting such a way that just drips with grace. You know why? Because I was holding on to grace with both hands every day. Now listen, that means this moment of weakness was not in the way of God's plan. It was the plan. Now, I want to give you homework. I'm serious. I want everybody to get something to, to write with. If it's only your phone, get out your phone. I want to give you homework. Because I don't want this to be just information. Now, you have a few more moments here. I want to give you four things to do every morning. You can do these fairly quickly. And I'm going to give you four words that I think can begin to change the way you think about yourself and think about the things you're facing. The first word is gaze, gaze. Take a few moments every, every morning to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I'm not talking about your normal Bible reading or Bible study or devotional reading. You say, Paul, I don't know what you mean. Well, just read a few verses from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 the prophet stretches the language as far as it goes and its elasticity somehow captures the glory, the glory of God. Or the last few chapters of Job where God has that where were you when the foundations of creation were laid and pulls back the curtain and reveals his glory. Or Ephesians 1 where we see the saving purpose of God sweeping through the, through the, the generations. Just take a few moments to focus the eyes of your heart on the beauty of the Lord. Second word, remember. Remember. 
Remember that that glory, that beauty, doesn't just define who God is, but redefines who you are as his child. Remember, preach that message, that identity to yourself, that he showered down his beauty down on you by grace. That changes everything. I'm not just Paul Tripp bumping my way through life because the Lord is my light, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is my stronghold. Third word, rest. Exhort your heart to rest, not because people like you, not because you're healthy, not because finances are working, not because... Study is successful, not because of any of those things, but because God is, he is your father, he is beautiful, and he showered that beauty down on you by grace. Rest. You have reason to rest. In the most chaotic moments, you have reason to rest. Fourth word, act, A-C-T. Now, Go out and live. Live with hope and courage and joy. Enough of timidity. Enough of rehearsing to yourself if you're having breakfast all the reason you need to be anxious that day. Enough of preaching false gospels to yourself. You have reason for courage. You have reason for hope. You have reason to be active. Because your Lord is beautiful and he showered that beauty down on you by grace. Our beautiful Savior came and suffered ugly things. So you and I would not only be forgiven, but would no longer be left to our little bag of resources. But we, but we would be connected to incalculable, transforming beauty. May we live that identity. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this psalm written in horrible difficulty, but reminding us of your stunning beauty and how that becomes our identity as your children. May we look through the ugliness that we will face in this broken world through the lens of your incalculable beauty and live with hope and courage. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.